Um, historical criticism, you're looking at basically the historical context context, the political uh, ramifications, of the uh, societal ramifications, all the different things that were going on outside of the text that would influence what is going on in the text that you've got. And the narrative criticism, um, how many people here are English majors? Anybody? Wow, there's like two, three, four, <laughs> okay. Um, you've probably used narrative criticism before. And so what we're going to do is we're actually going to use narrative criticism. And basically all narrative criticism is, is using literary tools, treating the gospel as a literary work, treating it as a complete whole and as a story that you've got. So narrative criticism, like I just said, it is viewing the, uh, the gospel or the biblical text that you're dealing with as a literary whole. Um, and you're applying these critical methods to that text. And the first critical method that you're doing is you're looking at who the implied author of that text is. And so for the Gospel of Mark, the implied author there is Mark. Um, for the, some of the letters that are claimed to be written by Paul, you know, Second Thessalonians, Ephesians, the implied author is Paul, even though it's not Paul who's writing those particular texts. Um, and so really, this is a really simple point. It's just who we think is writing the text or who is um, supposed to be writing the text from the text. The other is the implied reader, who this text is being written to. And so we have to look to see who, you know, what community the text um, was intended for. And so when we read any of these biblical um, narratives, any of these biblical texts, we're not ever the implied reader. Um, we always are in a different context than what these biblical texts were written specifically for. And so when we're looking at these narratives and looking at these texts, we have to put ourselves in that context to be able to understand a lot of the things that are going on within the text. And then maybe one of the most important things about narrative criticism is to do a normative reading of the text. And really all that means is you suspend your disbelief when you're reading it. Um, it's sort of like if you go to a movie and say you go to the, see the Lord of the Rings, you suspend your disbelief about what's going on. You really believe while you're watching the movie that you know, uh, Frodo is a hobbit or that there's these evil creatures running around even though you know in the back of your mind that that's not really the way um, the world works. Uh, the same is true when we look at any of these biblical texts. We just have to take it as a whole, believe it as it's going along, and then we can analyze it from that point on. So here's some more elements of narrative criticism, ways in which we can focus in on that normative reading that we have. Um, we can look at the characters that are in the text. And so if we wanted to, we could look at just Jesus. We could look at just the disciples. Or you know, we could look at the crowd. They're you know, really a character within this, this narrative as well. Um, we can look at the conflicts. You know, how does Jesus deal with when the Pharisees or Sadducees come to question him? Um, what does he do in those particular types of situations? We can look at the settings that you're in. And this is really an interesting one. Um, we could have done this instead of the discipleship one. But we could have looked at what happens every time um, they go into a house or every time they go into the synagogue. Certain things happen every single time that you go into the house or the synagogue or things that are happening in the countryside. Um, so maybe you'd want to do that in your discussion sections there is look at you know, what happens in the house. What happens in the synagogues, and how are they different? Um, another thing we can look at is plot, and just different questions that come from that plot, because there's a few different um, plots that are going through the gospel when we're reading the gospel there. Um, one of them is, how do the betrayals advance the plot of the story? You know, how do the betrayals of the disciples um, move us along and move us forward in the, the narrative that we've got? And if you remember the chiastic structure um, that Dr. Nichols talked about, the center, 
of the chiastic structure are the predictions that Jesus has about his crucifixion. Um, there are three betrayals in that section as well, uh, and three different ways in which the, the disciples just don't get it. And so how does that advance the plot? How does that move us forward? Symbolism. Uh, you can look at how the healing of the blind influences the, um, influences the text. And to refer back to that chiastic structure, the healing of the blind happens right before the predictions and right after the predictions. Um, and so how does that influence how these things are working how, and how the story moves forward? You can look at the symbolism of 12 disciples. Um, do they stand for the 12 tribes of Israel? Some people have purported that that, that is what they stand for um, and that this entire gospel is really just a motif for the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, and then the one that we're really going to look at is the themes. You know, there's a myriad amount of themes that are going, along, going on in the, the Gospel of Mark. And so the, one of them is the messianic secret. You know, Jesus is like, don't tell anybody that I'm the Messiah. Don't say anything. And he's telling the, the demons, you know, um, it, don't, don't say anything. You've got to keep it, keep it quiet. So that's one major theme in the, the, um, uh, the Gospel there. And so what does that mean? What theologically does that tell us when we're reading the Gospel? Um, discipleship, you know, what does that tell us about who, who this is being written to? And so we'll look at that a little bit closer. And then kingdom of God uh, motif, where, you know, Jesus is always talking about the kingdom of God is at hand. So what does that mean theologically? And how does that theme play into the entire gospel? And then there's a whole bunch of other themes that you could deal with. So you can see with narrative criticism, there's a lot of different ways in which you can encounter this text. Um, probably a lot of different ways than what we're really used to seeing the gospel at. You know, usually probably we just hear the gospel um, preached or hear the gospel read while we're in church. This is a completely different way of looking at that. So we're going to go ahead and look at the theme of discipleship. And this picture here is Jesus healing the woman um, with the hemorrhage. So the first question you might have is, what is this disciple? Um, you know, let's start off with some definitions first. You know, what is discipleship? Well, in the Gospel of Mark, discipleship is centered around the good news of Jesus and sort of focuses on what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And so when we just really take a look at the word disciple, all it really means is a follower. It's a student of a particular person. You, know, you can have a disciple of the Buddha. You can have a disciple of Christ. You can have a disciple of Aristotle. Um, they're all just students or followers of a particular, um, a particular person. And here's the Greek for the word disciple, mathetes. Um, and it's used 46 times in the Gospel of Mark. Now, an interesting fact about this word is that it's only used in the Gospels. It's not used in any of the letters, um, none of the letters of Paul, none of the other uh, epistles of the church. Um, it's only used in this form in the Gospels. And so you might ask yourself, as we're looking at this theme, you know, if discipleship is so important, why is it not used anywhere else in the Bible? Why is it only found in the Gospels, and why is it so concentrated in the Gospels? I mean, this word is used quite a bit in this Gospel of Mark. So let's look at, as sort of an um, intertextual criticism, look at how discipleship is seen in the other Gospels before we look at discipleship in the Gospel of Mark. And maybe that can help us figure out what's going on in Mark. So in Matthew and Luke, the disciples are pretty, they're uh, pictured pretty favorably. You know, we, we've got Jesus giving Peter the keys to the kingdom. Um, we've got, what is it, the ascension into heaven, and all the disciples are there in the, uh, the text there in Matthew. Um, and when Jesus uh, heals the widow's, uh, widow of Nain's son, the disciples in the crowd proclaim who Jesus is. They get it. They know who he is. And so in Luke, we see the disciples preaching and healing. 
And if you remember from Mark, the disciples, they have some problems doing that. 